welcome. This is uh, the talk I look forward to sharing with you guys today and then hopefully taking some questions at the end. When I was young, I loved things that made me feel small. And that included the night sky. I was from North Carolina, a small town. I used to look up at the night sky through the trees in my backyard and also things like the ocean. Anything that made me ponder the size of the universe, my place in it, what was out there and made me have a desire to explore. And when I was young, I went to Kennedy Space Center with my family on a trip and I absolutely fell in love with space. I was really fortunate because I got to go to space camp as a middle schooler and a high schooler. And I like to say that the posters that I bought in the Kennedy uh, Space Visitor Center gift shop, right where you guys are, are the same posters that I would hang up in my bedroom. This is my bedroom um, or my room at, when I went away to school. And you see this actual poster here was one that I bought um, at the visitor center there. Um, so those things in the posters, um, my bedroom wall became the dreams that I pursued in life. And for me, that meant studying physics, electrical engineering, you know, science and technology fields, and eventually getting work in um, what I like to call science on the frontiers. So I worked in space science instrumentation. I got to design the space gadgets that flew on planetary probes and earth orbiting satellites. And I also got to work in far off remote science bases all over the world, including Antarctica and Greenland. And so those two things formed my career path when I was lucky enough to find myself here as one of eight selected astronauts in the class of 2013 with NASA. Um, this began a series of trainings for us, which includes two years of learning how to fly a high performance jet, learning how to do spacewalks in a huge pool where we have a complete mock-up of the outside of the International Space Station, um, and learning all the systems on board what would eventually be my home, the ISS. And this is a picture of the ISS. You can imagine uh, the size here, if you kind of trace around those solar arrays, it's about the size of a football field. So it is absolutely huge. And I'm excited to say that as of last week, we actually have a new module on board the space station, uh, which you can't quite see where it would be on this picture, but we're still growing the space station and still making it an even better platform for science. So after all that training as an initial can uh, astronaut candidate, I eventually got my flight assignment, and that meant it was time to learn some flight specific things about the science that I would actually be doing on my mission. And that included testing on me, because a lot of the science that we do on board the space station is all about the human body and what we can learn from it by seeing how it adapts to zero or microgravity. I also got to learn how to fly the Soyuz spacecraft. This was an especially exciting part of my training. I got to live and train in Russia because we actually launched from Kazakhstan on a Russian rocket at that time. Uh, this is me on launch day and the capsule that we're in is right at the top of this vehicle, of this entire stack up. And what happens is after the eight minutes of those big engines on, we are released into orbit, the fairings of the rocket fall away, and our little Soyuz spacecraft is released and starts a six hour journey to the space station. Once it gets to the space station, this hatch right here actually docks to the space station and we open that same hatch and join our friends where I would be for almost a year. And I'll take a second here to let you know that we've since, uh, had brought on another capability of launching astronauts from U.S. soil on commercial rockets that's done right there at KSC, Pad 39, on a SpaceX rocket. So that's an exciting new thing that's happened since my mission where I launched from Kazakhstan. Once we the station, we start to work right away, and that includes things like maintenance, getting to fix, upgrade, and maintain all of the really complex systems, both for science and for just life support, power generation, all the things that keep the space station going so that it can be a platform for science. It also includes spacewalks because sometimes the things that we need to upgrade are actually on the outside of the space station. So that's when we get our spacesuits ready and we go to work on the outside of the space station. In this photo, you can see me working right here on the truss of the space station and the glorious, beautiful view that we have of Earth 250 miles below us when we're outside the space station. And during an entire spacewalk, we're actually guided through the whole spacewalk by people in mission control 
um, who know it as intimately as we do, and we get to have a lot of great teamwork working with Mission Control. Another wonderful thing about our time on orbit is the international cooperation. This is a picture of myself and my Soyuz commander, Alexei Evchinin, when we were actually getting some of the Russian spacesuits ready for one of their spacewalks. And I got the special privilege of also being on board in space when there were nine people on the International Space Station, including the first ever astronaut from the United Arab Emirates. And the international cooperation goes beyond that. I flew in space with astronauts from Italy, Canada, Russia, the United Arab Emirates, and we have all kinds of different international partners there. So it's a really great example of what we can do when we kind of come together to achieve great things. Now on to the main purpose of the space station, and that is science. We have all kinds of different science on board the space station from biology to physical science, earth science, space science. We're studying everything from how to grow plants in space to how we can make medicines that actually can only be manufactured or studied in microgravity, which is something I was really privileged to be able to do. We also operate the robotic arm of the space station. That's another big job duty that we have. And sometimes that even means being inside the space station, driving the robotic arm when we have a crewmate outside on a spacewalk repairing something. And that's what I got to do, um, you see us doing in this picture. So on board the space station, I just talked about all the things that we do for work, for our job. But yes, we have weekends in space and we also have off time. So a little bit more about that. What is everyone's favorite to do, thing to do in your time off? Eat, of course. <laughs> so we often spend time together and this is a picture of how we eat and drink in space. All of our food comes in packets, including our coffee. So this is what a coffee, my coffee uh, mug looked like every morning. And this is what macaroni and cheese looks like in space. Most of our food is rehydratable, but I actually thought it was really good and a good variety. When we have something to celebrate, like a birthday or maybe a big achievement, like a spacewalk, we get together for group meals, and this is us making space pizzas. Not the easiest thing to do, but if you clip your pizza dough down or use tape to keep it down, uh, you can put some, some toppings on it, wrap it up, and put it in our little food warmer, and you can enjoy a little taste of home and a taste of comfort food. Another thing that we do in our off time that's really important is exercise. Uh, I have a little video coming up that shows just a couple different things in life uh, on board the space station. So I'll narrate as we go. So first you see me about to do what we call weightlifting in space. And I'm setting up the machine that we use to create resistance on this bar so that we can keep our muscles and bones strong in space, even without microgravity. And one cool thing in this video that you can see is behind me, right on that, right behind me here, is the actual window where we look down on the earth that goes by. And if you watch this video, you can see the earth going by below as we orbit. Of course, no video from space would be complete without flipping or playing with your food with your crewmates. Brushing your teeth in space is also really fun. Obviously, water behaves a little bit differently up there. And even cleaning is really fun. In space, we don't vacuum the floor, we vacuum the air intake vents um, because obviously the dust doesn't go down to the floor. It just gets um, moved around by our ventilation systems and our life support systems. One of my personal favorite things to do was to look out that window down on the earth, um, a window called the cupola, like I mentioned, and to, to take pictures of places that were special to me. I took a lot of great pictures of KSC. The Florida Peninsula is a very, very clear uh, thing from space, and it's a really standout feature in our country and in our entire world. One of my favorite things to see though was night on Earth. And this is a picture of the aurora, um, the Northern Lights as they glowed from above on the, on the planet. And you can even see the docked Soyuz vehicles here um, in the view looking down on the Earth. But of course, even a, a long duration mission has to come to an end and eventually you find yourself uh, landing under a parachute in the Soyuz, in a landing capsule of the Soyuz. Um, we landed in Kazakhstan, the same country where we launched from. And 
the vehicle actually slows down by the friction that it of when it hits the atmosphere. So it actually starts to burn up and it's designed to take immense heat that happens when we enter the atmosphere. So that's why you see when our capsule lands, why it almost looks like it's burnt up, but that's actually by design. And the teams extract the crews from the top of the vehicle. And then um, in my case, getting back to Houston about 24 hours later and a, a couple days after that, finally getting to my home, my happy place, um, the beach near where I live. So that's a little bit about my mission and I'll talk a little bit now about the future and the direction we're going. Um, on board the space station, we call that space environment low earth orbit. And it's kind of the range of about 200 to 400 miles above the earth's surface where we basically have a sustained presence. We've been there for over 20 years, 20 years alone just on the space station and many years before that on other space stations and shuttle missions. But next we're looking to go beyond low earth orbit to return to the moon and to use the things that we develop and learn from those lunar missions and a sustained presence on the moon to go even further and go on to Mars. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Artemis today. Um, the Artemis mission is basically, like I mentioned, returning astronauts to the moon and eventually staying, staying there, learning more about the science, getting the technologies down. Here you see pictured uh, the actual Orion spacecraft, which is the capsule itself that's going to be going to the moon as part of the Artemis mission. And some other parts of the mission are the SLS rocket. SLS stands for Space Launch System, and it is actually being put together right near where you all have been. Um, I can't hear you guys in the audience, but raise your hand if you guys, any of you had a tour and got to see the VAB, the huge vehicle assembly building the, with the giant flag. Awesome. So this rocket is actually currently being assembled in that building. So this is a picture I took just the other day when I had the honor of visiting that building um, from the outside. And then this is what is inside the stack up of the core stage of the SLS rocket and the solid rocket boosters on each side. And then the Orion spacecraft will eventually be stacked on top. So speaking of Orion, Orion is also being serviced right there on Kennedy right now. This is what it would look like kind of uh, as it's expanded out. You have a launch abort system, the capsule itself, and some of the service module pieces here. And this is what it looked like just recently. Um, I also had a chance to go see it here. These are a couple of my colleague astronauts taking a look at it. And um, as you can see, it is getting fueled right now. It's getting ready for launch, uh, like I mentioned, right there at Kennedy Space Center. So this is what it looks like as of right about now. So overall, our plan for Artemis is to, first of all, use the SLS to launch the Orion capsule with first without astronauts and then with astronauts around the moon and back. And then down in the later Artemis missions, like Artemis 3, we will actually also send a human lander and we will have human astronauts on the moon again. Um, and the plan is to do that in this decade. So it is coming right up. Some of the other exciting developments are the actual spacecraft controls and the suits that the astronauts will wear. These orange suits are what we call launch and entry suits because they're not meant to go out and do spacewalks in. They're just meant to be in the capsule. And the reason you need a suit in the capsule is just in case we had an um, unexpected depressurization. If all the air went out of the capsule while we were in space, those suits would keep the crew safe. Um, so this is a little view of some of the testing that's gone on in a mock-up of the Orion vehicle. The other really cool thing we're working on are the new EVA or the new spacewalk suit. So this is me um, in a, the current spacewalk suit, and you can see um, how it looks different from the one that we're developing for moon use. Um, the one we're developing has a lot more ability to move around. You can lean down and pick up things like rock as we're studying the geology of the moon to learn about the formation of our solar system. Um, and it allows a lot more mobility to move your arms around in different places, to turn, to squat, and things like that. So this is a really exciting development for that that we're doing for Artemis. Eventually, the Artemis mission will also include uh, deployed science on the surface of the moon, not just the human lander that you see here, but science that's going to be waiting for the astronauts when they get there to conduct um, on the surface. And then eventually down the road, 
will have sustained presence. We'll have lunar um, lunar buggies, uh, lunar vehicles, uh, sustained lunar stations, and all of this is going to be in the 2020s, 2030s, and it's just such an exciting time to be with NASA and to be in the astronaut program. And to me, the most exciting part is that this all is going to lead up to a Mars mission. Um, at Mars, we can answer some of the biggest questions of our time, questions like, are we alone? Is there life out there? Um, and all that basically takes a huge team of people. It takes astronauts in place in Mars to do the science, to be reactive, to understand what we're seeing and take it all in and bring those answers back to Earth to not only improve lives on Earth, but to really have that perspective of where we fit in that big universe. So with that, I will pause here and open it up to questions and anything you guys are curious about. Christina, thank you so very much. That was a great presentation. Are you gonna be sticking around in the astronaut core and possibly going back out into space or possibly going to the moon with the Artemis program? I am absolutely staying in the astronaut corps. Um, I am active in the astronaut corps now. I maintain my training on a regular basis. So I get to fly in that T-38. I do my spacewalk training in the MBL. And I also work in mission control with the real-time operations on board the space station. In fact, I'll be in mission control tonight, talking to the astronauts through their day tomorrow. Um, they're a little bit ahead of us in timing. So our night is their day. And um, so, yeah, I'm very active in the astronaut corps. I'm really happy to be bringing all the things that I learned on my mission back to the teams, back to the engineers, back to the operations teams, so that we can hopefully just keep improving and keep building and exploring further and pushing the boundaries. Well, we're excited to have you working with us and everything that you've done for us so far. I'm going to uh, have ask the people to raise their hand and we'll bring a microphone to you and you can ask questions of Christine. Anybody have a question? So all the way over to the other side of the room, you've got a pretty good sized group here, Christine. That's one of the largest I've seen for any of our presentations so far. I see that. I'm honored that so many people were interested. I hope I get to a lot of questions today. Here you go. Just talk right to the end. And I'm not hearing the speaker. Yeah, we're not hearing him. Hold on just a second. And I was a little hard to hear with the microphone. Maybe the host can repeat the question. I heard it was about Orion and people in space. So, when the space craft is going to send people who pay can space. Yeah, he, he wants to know approximately when the spacecraft are going to be taking people up into space there. Gotcha. Yes, thanks for that question. I, I thought maybe the question was when. Good question. So here, let me see. I'll show you a couple different um, different pictures here. We'll get back to the one with Orion. So this rocket is first expected to launch by the end of this year. And that mission, though, will not have people on it. But a year later, we hope to actually have people on a mission like that. So I think you could expect people to be on this rocket and in the Orion vehicle um, on their way to go around the moon by about 2023 or 2024. And I'll show you something else here that might be interesting. So this is a little graphic that I think is pretty fun that shows how we're going to get those people to the moon. So what happens is you first launch from Earth. And like I said, this will be around 2022, 2023, um, 2024, launching around the moon. And then we do a basically what's called a translunar injection rocket burn so that we leave Earth orbit and we head around the moon. We then can enter the moon's orbit and then eventually head back home and start to orbit around Earth again. So there'll be several um, Artemis missions in the coming years, and um, you should definitely keep an eye on the schedule because there'll be plenty of opportunities to pay attention when we're sending people in their Orion spacecraft. 
I love when you show the pictures of the, uh, the new space launch systems in there, because that system is going to have approximately 1.7 million pounds more thrust than the Saturn V rocket. Now, I lived in Cocoa Beach when I was growing up, and I was way down on South 10th Street, and three times the atmospheric conditions were perfect when we had Apollo launches and it cracked windows in our house. So I can imagine what the new one's going to be like. I can only imagine, and I think you folks in Cocoa Beach will be the ones that really get the the most of that. You'll probably not be able to know. You'll, you'll definitely know when it takes off. I know that I enjoy watching even the uh, SpaceX launches from the beach there in Cocoa Beach. So I can only imagine what the largest, most powerful rocket ever built will really look like from there. Hopefully we'll get to see by the end of this year. I have a question. Are there bathrooms in space? <laughs> there are bathrooms in space and I'll show you the bathroom on board the space station. So here is a picture of our bathroom on board the International Space Station. And basically, it's a real simple system. Um, you can either use the funnel if that's all you need. And there's even a actual toilet. And now, since we don't have gravity to make everything go where we need it to go, what we do is it, the whole system is kind of like a little light fan or light vacuum. And basically, that ventilation, that air path keeps everything going where it needs to go so it stays um, where we can keep it. And believe it or not, we get rid of our, our waste of our, you know, human waste on a empty cargo vehicle. So to get all of our supplies, we have spaceships come and bring us all our supplies. But then when those spaceships are empty, we fill them up with our trash and that includes human waste. So all of it goes down and eventually burns up in the atmosphere of the earth. And that's how we get rid of it. Now, is it true that the, uh, the station that we're seeing right now is pretty much right next to where they cook the food? It's not super close. It's pretty close. So if you look, there's about this much space. Right here is the treadmill. And actually, I can show you. So if you see this right here is the treadmill. If you can just sort of make out like those slats there. And I'll give you some perspective. Back to this video. So remember, the, tr the, the, tr the uh, bathroom is here. The treadmill is here, and then if you go back to this video, the um, that's the treadmill right there, and so right behind that person is the bathroom, and then this is our kitchen. So it's not right next to it, but it's not that far away. It's definitely not a problem. There's not a whole lot of space anyway. Here's your next question. Uh, what point in your education do you think was the most important to get to where you are today? Excellent question. Absolutely. I completely agree. It is an excellent question. I think the most important part of my education um, was not necessarily just the classes that I took, but the extracurricular activities, the things that I did beyond just the easy path that might have been laid out there from picking the majors that I picked. So, for example, I um, chose to pursue rock climbing because it was something that intrigued me, something that almost scared me a little bit, made me made me wonder if it was something that I could really do, but I was very interested. And becoming a rock climber actually taught me teamwork, it taught me to push myself, it taught me to focus, it taught me to be physically fit, um, and it taught me how to pursue difficult things on my own. And that I would really credit even more so than doing everything academically, that was put in front of me. Um, that's a given. You know, you have to focus on your studies. You have to do that. But reaching out and doing those extra things that really enrich your life, that give you teamwork opportunities, uh, that give you a chance to see what you can do when you really apply yourself and really do tough things. I think those are the most important part of my education. And interestingly, when I went to interview to become an astronaut, we talked more about rock climbing than we did about my academic studies or about you know, the technical work that I had done as an engineer. So that would be my advice. And here's your next question. How long do you think you're going to be an astronaut? And is that what you wanted to be on a show? It is what I wanted to be. Um, I... I have wanted to be an astronaut for as long as I can remember, maybe from the time I was five years old. But as I said earlier, I really decided I wanted to be an astronaut when my family visited Kennedy Space Center. And that was maybe around when I was 10 years old or something like that. And um, as 
as far as how long I want to be an astronaut, I can't envision, since I've never not wanted to be an astronaut, I can't envision a time when I wouldn't want to be one in the future either. So I'm going to keep applying myself and keep giving everything I can give to the astronaut program and to human space flight for as long as I'm able to. All right, we're coming up to the front with the next question. I wish you could see the faces on these kids in here as you're talking and they're watching you, they're just fixated on every word you say and it's absolutely wonderful to see this. How did it feel to get back to Earth and get a gravity? Oh, good question. How does it feel to get back to Earth? Here, let me put up a little picture to show that moment. So getting back to Earth is uh, a funny feeling because in my case, I had not walked on my own feet for a really long time. I didn't even remember what it was like to walk. And suddenly I was in gravity. My whole body felt really, really heavy. I was really dizzy because my brain hadn't hadn't been in a gravity for a long time. And so at first it's very disorienting. It's hard to walk, it's hard to balance, but eventually you get used to things and you start to walk a little bit and you start to be able to move quickly. Um, another funny thing about coming back from space is that you drop things a lot because in space, you don't really have to hold on to things very hard. You could just kind of, they just sort of float around your hand. But obviously on Earth, you really have to hold on to things. So I was dropping my keys a lot and things like that. Um, and another thing that's about when you get back to space is all the people that are on Earth. When I was in space, I only saw 11 other people for almost an entire year. So you can imagine when I came back, um, learning how to just do all the normal things, go to the grocery store, go to a restaurant, um, interact with my friends, all that was new again. and so it was a obviously a, we have what's called rehabilitation so we have physical trainers that help us learn how to do things like walk um but it, it's a process so you have to really be patient with it but overall i was just so happy um, i'll never forget the moment when i first got back and i smelled the smell of the ocean i felt the sand um, on my feet. I saw my dog for the first time, um, my husband, and all the people I love, and uh, that was an amazing thing. All right, here we go. Um, what kinds of things are you allowed to bring into space? Good question. We aren't allowed to pack very much, just about the size of maybe a shoebox or two of things. And let me see here a good picture to show some of that um so the things that i brought to space with me were mostly things for other people i brought a lot of things that i would be able to give to my friends family and loved ones when i got home so that they would know how much i appreciated their support and they would have a memento that had been in space from me. but i did bring a couple things for myself and one of them was a board game scrabble um, I really like to play Scrabble, and this is me playing Scrabble, <laughs> travel Scrabble in space with some of my friends. I also brought some, or actually a crewmate of mine brought some paper to make origami in space. It's hard, it's hard to do a lot of crafty things in space because everything just floats away, but origami is something that you can do. And then my favorite thing of all time that I had in space were handwritten letters from my loved ones. So Whenever we got those cargo spaceships that would come, they would have a care package on board for us. And our friends and loved ones would put things in that care package for us. And when they would put something in that was handmade or, or a letter that they wrote out themselves, that was what was really special because it helped me feel connected to them. And it was something that they had actually held that I could then have um, for myself. So those are really the kinds of things I brought. And of course, chocolate. You have to pack chocolate when you go to space. Here we go. Next question. Did most of your ships have solar panels on them? Yes, they do. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, solar panels is what I, I heard. We'll yes. go back to the big picture of the space station. So in this picture, the space station actually has eight sets of solar panels. And it actually has each one of those sets of solar panels has a power channel, which means it can feed power to the systems of the space station. And that's when you, like I said, if you take into account all these solar panels, 
They're about the size of a football field. And the space station also has some solar panels back here in the aft or back part of the space station. And then in addition, all of the um, cargo vehicles that come to visit station also have solar panels. So if you look at this spacecraft, this is the Soyuz and we're sitting inside this little capsule. These are solar panels right here. Um, but there are other ways to make electricity or power in space. And some vehicles um, in, that are going really, really far out into the solar system where the sun isn't bright enough to use solar arrays, they use different kinds of power generation. We use batteries sometimes, we use nuclear power um, sources sometimes. So there's a lot of different ways that you can generate power out in space. There you go. When uh, is a SpaceX rocket gonna um, be launching towards the moon? Was that the SpaceX rocket gonna be launching towards but the moon? They're asking if the SpaceX rocket is gonna be launching people to the moon. Yeah, so great question. So currently, uh, the SpaceX rocket that is in current use is only going to and from the space station. Um, and that was basically what it was designed to do. It takes four astronauts to and from the space station. In the future, however, NASA and SpaceX are partnering up again to have SpaceX build what's called the Human Landing System, or HLS. And that partnership has been in place for a long time. And SpaceX is one of is has bid to be a builder of that landing system onto the moon. So we'll see if uh, SpaceX ends up building that human lander. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, how does the rocket get made? And how do you use a sink? How do rockets get made and how do you use a sink in space? <laughs> how do the rockets get made and how do you use a sink in space? Use a sink? Yes. Okay, great. Well, first I'll talk about the rocket and I have a picture to show exactly how the rocket gets made. One thing that when I was little, I used to get not understand was how do they what how do they put that spaceship inside the rocket. I don't see it out there. Well, this shows how they do that. So if you see here, this piece is the actual rocket out, outer fairing or outer cover. And this is our Soyuz spacecraft that we actually sit in. And they actually insert the spacecraft into the rocket here. Then they take this part of the rocket and put it on top of the part of the rocket that has all the fuel. And so together, the part with all the fuel and then some kind of adapter, and then the part that has the spacecraft in it that has the humans in it. And then of course, something at the top um, to make it be aerodynamic. And also usually on the top is what we call a launch abort system, which means that if something goes wrong with the rocket, that system can pull the spacecraft off of the rocket, like say if it starts to explode or move in the wrong direction, and then the astronauts can be safe. Um, so those are the parts of the rocket. And then there's also a picture I will show you. Um, I showed it a little bit in the beginning. We can show it again here of how we're building the SLS rocket. So in the VAB, which is close to where you all are right now, there's this huge structure that supports the rocket as it stands up. So here, I'll, I'm going to point out some things. So this center part, this orange part here is called the core stage. And that is the same as this core stage. And in this, when it's out, this would be what it looks like when it's out on the launch pad. Then you can barely see it, but these pointy parts here are the top of the side strap-on rockets, which are actually called solid rocket boosters because their fuel is solid, not liquid. And if you look at that, those are just the tops of that. So that's how we actually construct the rocket. We have a building with like a big 3D kind of puzzle cutout that the rocket, the entire rocket fits inside of so that we can build it up together. So it's a very, very intricate, complex process. And it's just awesome that our engineers at Kennedy Space Center have been constructing this rocket. Um, and then the other question you had, 
how do we use a sink in space? So I know what picture I'm gonna use for that. And it's one that I showed earlier, but believe it or not, this right here is our sink in space. Doesn't look like a regular sink on earth because in space, we don't have gravity to bring the water out of the faucet and down to the drain. So what do we do? We just basically have a little water dispenser and it just flows out a little bit of water. And so what we do is we take a water packet or a drink packet like this one and this fitting here goes onto the water dispenser. And when they're nice and tight and the water can't get out, we press a button and it puts water into our drink and that is how we get water in space. So we, uh, we do not have a space sink. We have to figure out a new and different way to do everything that you normally do in your sink or your shower. We have a different way to do it in space because no gravity to bring that water down the drain. It would just float around the room. Hi, Christina. What's the most rewarding part of being an astronaut? Boring? Rewarding. Oh, rewarding. <laughs> <laughs> Very different. I think that the most rewarding part of being an astronaut is representing the dreams and hopes of everyone on Earth when you travel into space. Exploration is a human endeavor. It's something that is part of the human condition. It's part of what unites us. It's part of what makes us who we are um, as inhabitants of Earth. Every one of us inside has some kind of drive to explore. And as an astronaut, we get to be the ones, we get to have the honor and privilege of going into space and carrying out that human desire to explore, making the discoveries in space that can only be made there and bringing that knowledge back to Earth where it can benefit everyone on Earth. And representing the people that got me into space and that includes every single person in this country and in fact in the whole world that supports human space flight representing your dreams and carrying them with me and sharing the journey and making sure to give it back is to me the most rewarding part of about being an astronaut here's another question for you what's your favorite thing in space hmm. my favorite thing well i would say it would have to be a tie um, one of my favorite things was the teamwork. Working together with my crewmates was just absolutely awesome. And working together with the ground teams and being a part of something that took so much work, so much dedication, and so much drive to do difficult things, to do challenging things together. And being part of that team was, was one of the most awesome things and my favorite thing. Um, I also love, like I said, looking down on the earth and to see a scene like this was absolutely beautiful. Um, and I also loved downtime. I loved connecting with, um, my family back home. We got to do, this is, uh, me doing a video call, uh, with someone from home. So that was a really fun thing to be able to do. Um, I loved reading in space. So I hope all you guys like reading. This is a picture of me by my favorite window of the space station doing some reading on the weekend. So there's a lot of things that um, really made me happy when I was when I was in space. It's hard to just pick one favorite thing. Do you have enough time for a couple more questions? Absolutely. Okay, here we go. Go ahead. Okay, now I'm How does it work? So obviously a landing mission on the moon or Mars quite a bit different than your current missions that you've gone on in the ISF. So my question is, what are you most looking forward to besides obviously being on another planetary body? If you were to be one of the next people on the moon again or Mars, what are you most looking forward to if you should get the opportunity to do that? You know, if I were to be so lucky uh, to do something like that, I think the thing I would look more forward to the most would be actually some of the same things I just mentioned, because there are things that transcend where you're doing your work it's really about who you're working for what you're contributing to and what the bigger goals of that mission are and i see those goals as kind of the same between the space station or mars you're working towards making earth a better place by bringing scientific discovery and knowledge back to earth by um meeting the the innate human desire to explore 
by answering some of those big questions that we have. Are we alone? Where are we from? How did our solar system form? And doing all of that while working as part of, as part of a team where everyone is united in a mission and a goal to do all those things together. So that would absolutely be my favorite part of being involved in an Artemis mission and going to the moon. Um, I think just day to day, it would be really fun to be in one of those space suits and explore the surface of the moon. Um, you know, here I'll, you brought up a comparison between um, an ISS mission and the moon mission, and just the idea of walking around on another celestial body in heaven, or sorry, in space, and um, exploring that in a spacesuit um, just sounds really, really fun, especially as part of a bigger mission, like I mentioned. Thank you, Christina. Uh, I was wondering what do you think would be uh, I guess best would be to help out NASA, like if I want to go to school, would that be like aerospace engineering or mechanical engineering to continue the um, help with getting us to further uh, out in space? I think I heard the question was, um, what do you, was it what do you recommend studying to be able to give back to NASA? Yeah, he was saying what would be the best classes to take or to study if he wants to work at NASA and help out and help us getting onto the moon and, and further out to Mars. Gotcha. You know what? It's really neat because actually you can study almost anything and be involved in that mission. If you want to be one of the technical people designing things or designing the operations or planning the missions, absolutely. An engineering field or a science field, maybe a planetary geology field any of those work. But the cool thing about NASA is we have people from every single type of profession that you can imagine. We have lawyers, we have international contract workers, we have schedulers, uh, we have people doing training plan, doing the training, we have people doing the engineering, we have people designing the science. So there's almost everything that you can possibly imagine. We have people that work in outreach, making sure that we're sharing what we do with the public. So anything that you love, if you love space too, you can probably bring that to NASA. You want to be on the technical side, absolutely. Aerospace, engineering, mechanical engineering. I myself studied electrical engineering and physics. So really um, also medical doctors. We have doctors as part of our team. So there's really nothing. I think the most important thing is to do what you're passionate about, to do what you truly love. I think when you do what you love, you excel at it. You do the best, you give back the most to the world, and um, that's going to make you successful, and it's going to make you be able to be successful at NASA as well. So look at what you love and, and pursue that. Christine, we thank you for your time. We don't want to take up any more of your time. We thank you so much for being here. I have never seen a group of people that is so enthralled and ask so many questions of anybody that we've ever had in here. So we hope and pray that you'll be coming back and seeing us again soon. Well, this has really been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's a privilege to be back at the place that sparked my interest in space and that made me excited to eventually become an astronaut. Um, you guys are at the heart of it all, and I hope you really enjoy your visit. Thanks for your awesome questions, and uh, keep exploring. Thank you so very much. We'll see you soon.